Hello, everybody. Um, this is Alumni Live and a special little broadcast for you. Um, my name is Joe McCarger, former professor at Grand Valley State University in the Visual Media Arts Department in Film and Video. And uh, today, our subject is the other half of the picture. In other words, half the meaning. In other words, sound. It's our sound issue. And I have with me Brian Hensley and Sean Quashney, alumnuses, no, alum, alumni, yes, um, from the mid to late 1990s. Am I right about that? Brian, when, oh, there we are. Brian's uh, 1993, and Sean, you are? 95. 95, so goes back a ways. Um, I just uh, want to talk to you, and I hope that uh, those of us who are hearing and listening are um, uh, getting the opportunity to see what life's like in the sound business. And again, what's cool about it, it's from kind of two different perspectives. One is much more in the live area, uh, what, what might be called production sound area in the world of broadcast and, and uh, movies in terms of production sound. And the other is a post-production, um, particularly in the gaming world. And uh, there's there's wonderful experiences that are common to both. You're, you know, you sound's got the upper hand in both situations, but um, one is slightly more controlled. The other is you know, right out there. So I, I'd like to begin by kind of asking the question, what what was the circumstance or say series of events or the environment that got you guys going into the fields that you're going into? If you would say first briefly what it is you do and then what was that thing that, that started this all off for you? Brian, go ahead. Sure. Um, well, glad to be here. This is a, this is a great forum, and uh, it's, it's it's really uh, really fun to do these things. Um, so, for me, I uh, I graduated in '93, and I was lucky enough to um, uh, meet somebody here in studio, and uh, I, I got to. It was about the oh the summer before my junior year um, in college, and I got to come down and see. Uh, a post audio place, um, and at, at, up to that point, I had been kind of just kind of doing as many different things as I could in college. I was, you know, editing and filming and doing as many different things just to sort of figure out my path. And then when I went down to Chicago and and stepped foot into that studio, it was like the the light bulb went off for me. It was just like this is where I want to be. I love post production audio, um, and it, the rest is history. I got a job. I was lucky enough to get a job right out of college and here in Chicago. And I've uh, been doing it ever since. Um, I worked at a, a couple different post houses. And then about three years ago, I came on um, to the company I'm working uh, working at now, which is called Noise Floor. And then uh, this past January, they invited me to become part owner um, of the company. Um, and so uh, that's that's kind of what I'm doing now. And we're, we do full service post audio. We do uh, films. We do video games, as you mentioned. We do commercials. We do documentaries, television. Um, and, and we have a staff composer as well. So we really, in terms of posts for, for the visual medium, um, it, we really kind of do it all. And, and it's been just a wonderful career for me so far. So, and lots, lots more to, lots more to go. Sounds terrific. Sean, what about you? Um, I do location sound and, uh, audio for, uh, TV broadcast. Um, I think I got started, uh, in, well, it took me a while to get the sound. I started uh, in grip and lighting, uh, did a few years of that, and noticed that there was a need for sound people in uh, locally here in, in Grand Rapids and kind of bought my own kit and started going out as a sound person. Um, since then, uh, have done too many corporate uh, videos to count. Um, uh, a bunch of uh, reality show type work and uh, feature films when they were here, uh, when we had the film incentives, uh, did a few of those. And uh, the sports broadcast, uh, audio for that, everything from uh, uh, high school sports to uh, a few Super Bowls and Stanley Cups doing audio. Wow, that'll, 
that's throwing you into the deep end. That's fantastic. Um, in terms of uh, looking kind of at a practical matter, what what's a typical day for you guys? Um, in terms of preparation, you know, you get up, you have your two cups of coffee, and assuming that there is a you know a specific um, project for the day, what what's that like, Brian, for you? Um, well, really, it comes down to what the, what that project is. Uh, like I said, and in, in the wonderful thing about where I work is that each day is a little bit different. You know, if, if it's a commercial that day, or if it's a film that day, or if it's the video game stuff. Um, but really, it's it's come in. You know, get the get the elements that I need. If it's a if it's a commercial or a, or whatever, you know, we'll get you know a quick time in a in an OMF or an AF. You bring those things in. Um, in, into into a workstation and and then you start you know start start breaking things down you're going through you know the production audio um and making sure that's all where we need it to be and then i then we start to do, depending on what we're doing and then we start to sound design we're adding ambience and backgrounds and any kind of special sound effects or or whatever um uh, that we're creating um you know bringing in the music if it's getting composed by our composer you know uh, he'll pop in kind of see what i'm doing sound design wise um, you know, and then the, the cool part about here is we can kind of move back and forth from from the sound design suite to the composition suite and, and kind of really work with each other to make sure everything is complementary. Sometimes you can you get a sound designer going off doing their thing and the composers doing their things. You bring things together and they don't always they don't always jive. Um, but but here, you know, we I can just run down the hall and say, hey, Devin, what are you doing? You know, right now with the, in, in this particular spot. And he can tell me. Um, he can tell me what he's doing there. I can listen to it, and then I can go back and, and work on my sound design to make sure it's working with what he's doing. Um, and then, and then once you get all the elements in place, you know, um, in, in the way we like them, then we're then we're doing final mixes and and making sure uh, everything's sounding good. Um, you know, and and right now we're not we don't have clients in as much as we normally do. Obviously, with everything going on, so it's a lot of just sending mixes off or doing. Um, you know, kind of a remote session with with clients and things like that for final mixes, uh, where we just send them send them a mix and they listen to it and give us comments and we kind of shoot it back and forth that way. Um, and then that's it's kind of wrapped up. Um, so that's sort of a regular day. If we're working on a film, it's a little more involved in that. Um, you know, depending on the part that I'm doing of the film, usually the films we're doing as a team. So we we kind of break up each role um, amongst the team. You know, with dialogue editors and and Foley artists and, and sound effects editors and sound designers. And so everyone's kind of taking their little piece of it and doing their part. So that, that day would look a little bit different. The video game stuff's a whole different kind of process. Um, so yeah, it really depends on what the project is and, and then, you know, we go from there. I suspect it varies, but you're, you're, you're into probably anywhere from an eight hour day to a 16 hour day. Is that, does yeah. it vary that widely? Yeah, it does. It, it really just depends. In, in, um, it's funny that the, a friend of mine was telling me a, a term recently, and I don't know who came up with it, but I liked. I liked it. it. There was this thing called a passion tax, and it's like when you when you do what you love, um, you just you just do whatever the hours are required, and that's that's sort of how I approach. You just kind of my passion, and I just work however long it is. But it, it's anywhere from eight to twelve to fourteen. Or more, depending on what's needed. Okay, um, um, Sean, what about yourself? Uh, I suspect, uh, you know, being out in the world, it's a it's a little bit different uh, for setup. Uh, yeah, every uh, every day, every job is a little bit different. Um, they usually start the night before while you're uh, prepping and and loading gear. Make sure you know a little bit uh, what the project's about. Make sure you have uh, the proper equipment and enough of it. Um, and then it's kind of hurry up and wait. Um, sound is uh, usually <laughs> waiting on uh, camera and lighting. And then we jump in there uh, at the last minute with our uh, wired microphones. And um, before that, we'll put on uh, wireless microphones on talent. Uh, and then it's just kind of see what happens during the day. Um, and it can range from running around, uh, following a tap, uh, tablet, excuse me, following talent with a boom pole or, uh, you know, sitting in a corporate environment, recording some, uh, CEOs. Well, I, 
and uh, I love I love the challenges of live sound myself. Um, love them both. Um, so this just kind of goes to a personal thing. Um, a question that I I always like to ask uh, people who've been doing it for a while, but beginning with you, Sean, what what about kind of like your core personality or your temperament? I guess you would say makes you do you feel makes you suited to this kind of work um what is it that as brian says what makes you kind of predisposed to the passion of doing this um it's kind of something that uh, gradually uh came along i kind of fell into audio um as i mentioned before uh lack of audio people uh, in town here and things just kind of steamrolled from there i really uh, I bought my own equipment to uh, get the business started and just each job is different. And that's one of the things that I find very enjoyable. And uh, there's always a challenge. And those are two of the big things that, that I enjoy um, and the people I work with. Oh yeah. I can see that. Brian, what about yourself? What, what, what is it in your personality that you think makes you really suited to this? Um, boy, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. I, I, I guess it would just be, um, you know, I love working with people and this is a, this is a, a team sport, you know, it's, it's, you got to work with a lot of different people. Sometimes you're by yourself, but a lot of times you've got, you know, a room full of, of seven or eight people and, and they all want different things. They all want to hear different things. They all want, you know, and being able to sort of achieve that, you know, listening to all the different voices and be, being able to sort of get what they're looking for and making sure everybody walks out, um, getting what they, what they want. Um, and so I think I, I deal pretty well with, with different personalities and, you know, I think I'm pretty patient. Um, and, and so I, I think that's really it is just being able to work with either a large group of people, a small group of people, or a, a single director on a film or whatever. Um, you know, just shifting gears a little bit, and when, and 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 certainly as when I became an owner here, um, also working with with the staff, you know, and and being able to deal with the different personalities of of our different different designers and composers as well, um, has brought a different, slightly different challenge to it as well. Um, let let's talk just a little bit about like career paths. Um, the you know for myself it it kind of falls into that that same area where um started out as a uh, musician and i'll put that in quotes because um i didn't i wasn't truly a musician but um started up a band a rock and roll band and that um that, that that's that's in the beatles era where i said to myself geez <laughs> I want to do that, you know, because of just how much fun it, it was. And um, and so we just we started, you know, uh, playing quite a bit. We ended up um, getting signed uh, to a wonderful record company called uh, Capital Records, which we were kind of like third or fourth tier. You know, we weren't the Beatles, but um, what that did with me, and you know, when I talked about this, the environment or the thing that tipped you towards this was, I was in the studio as a performer, and but it, I always was kind of curious about what happened on the other side of the glass, and I'm thinking, wow, that's interesting. Of course, we would go in there to listen to mixes and stuff like that, and I thought, boy, this is, uh, my chances of being a rock star are very, very rare. Um, but this looks like a great plan B to me. And indeed, uh, when I, when I finished my first teaching job out in Montana, I came back and one of my friends in the band was working at a recording studio. So it's like, you know, what else do you want in life in terms of luck? And, uh, that ended up to be River City where, um, I am to this day. So I came back to... Grand Rapids from Montana, where I taught and ended up uh, at this recording studio in 1977. So it's a it's a long term uh, job. About 1980, and I want to kind of 
pretty close to 1980, I got a call from this uh, this uh, local college, Grand Valley State College, as it was at that time. And uh, the chair of the uh, School of Communication said, you know, we heard that you, you teach and we're interesting if you'd interested in, if you'd like to do a um, an advanced audio class and i thought for about a second and i said yep <laughs> and so the rest is history and then as i continue to teach my world shifted from straight up uh, uh studio work to teaching what i knew and with a bs and ed it just followed uh right along um the, the interesting the name of the um the band originally that I was in that kind of got this whole thing going was uh, called the Frederick. And that was named after Frederick, Michigan, where we were traveling through to to uh, back up a national act up in, believe it or not, Gaylord. There was a real cool teen club up there that these guys uh, were going to play at. So we ended up doing that, renamed ourselves from original name to the Frederick. And then when we signed with Capital, we became uh, the Rock Garden. And then after our first release and our second release, we be release, we became the Garden. So uh, you couldn't lead a more magical life. You know, you just happened to get signed with a record company, being a 17 year old in a rock band and end up with a 40 year career in teaching and, and recording. So um, much gratitude there. Um, I had some other, uh, see, speaking of which, uh, as a teacher and as a sound recordist, um, I've had uh, a, a few, what I call projects from hell. And it's one of those things where you, you get an, into something and it all looks good. And then something about the circumstance or the, uh, the performers or some group dynamic just sends it right into the toilet. And I, I'm always interested, you know, from a professional standpoint, especially with you guys having done so much, um, w w describe for me, if you would, uh, Brian, a project from hell that you remember and and what made it that way um well yeah you always have those and it, it, sometimes projects just seem cursed you know like no matter what you do yes you, we you use know. the term snake bitten yeah yeah and and you just you just have those the ones that usually um stick out in my mind i don't have a specific example in mind but usually it has to usually revolves around picture changes and and um, and it happens for whatever reason, you know, they have to go back in and it's always that conforming. It's always that, okay, we, you know, you've got a 10 minute project and they, they re-edited it. And so you got to, you know, you've got all your sound design done, you got your music done, you got everything done. And it's like, oh yeah, we need to go in and, you know, we're removing, you know, five seconds here, you know, two frames there, or, yes. or you know, whatever it might be. And then you got to go in there and meticulously go in there and, you know, make sure everything's lining up and inevitably there's, there's a cut they didn't tell you about and it's like still not lining up. And it's, it's usually those that are the ones that stick out in my mind where, where I'm having to conform all my audio to, to a new picture. And, um, the short ones usually are okay. Um, I've had it happen on feature films and it's, it's just, oh my gosh. Yeah. you know, you got, you got several hundred tracks, you know, and you're trying automation everywhere and you're, digging through going why is it not working where is it you know and, yeah. and I, hear you. So. I usually that that i kind of chalked up to chalk up to a situation where the the client seems to know what they want but they really don't <laughs> <laughs> and, and that you know you can just you see that coming like a freight train and yep. yeah what about you sean a, um, a project from hell I think uh, one of the 50 cent films that shot in Grand Rapids, uh, we shot over the winter and 18 hour days outside in bitter cold. Um, that's not, not fun. Um, especially when you're on set for, for the 18 hours and you maybe roll an hour of dialogue if you're lucky, but, uh, 
you know, you're sitting around waiting. There you are now. I can see a picture there of you standing, standing in the middle of Lake Michigan there. Yeah, it's a uh, um, weather, uh, you know, things can be very extreme in location stuff. And, you know, uh, that's my biggest adversary, rain and, and snow. Right. But but think about all the growth <laughs> that yeah. happens to you in getting through that stuff. Um, another question I had, um, this is, I think it's kind of a practical matter because it involves your employment and it goes to your personality as well. Um, uh, Sean, what is it about you, say, as a person and as a, if, you know, to call it something very basic, as a vendor, that you think makes um, a, a client come back to you, uh, you know, often because you you both know that in this business, what we rely upon is that repeat business where you gain the trust of someone and you've got an ally for for years. What what do you think it is about you personally that makes the the client uh, keep keep coming back? To Sean. Um. I think uh, a worth ec work ethic has a lot to do with it. Um, when I'm on set, you know, I'm trying to bust my butt and have uh, clients see me working and know that uh, they're going to get a good, good prod uh, product. Um, and also being able to work with the rest of the crew, you know, if grip and lighting needs a hand, you know, jump in and do a little bit, bit of help. Uh, you know, not so much on a, a union job, but on our uh, local work here, the uh, film community, uh, film and video community here is, you know, a lot like a big family. We've been working together for years and uh, we're friends with each other. And, you know, we, uh, the goal is a, a great project. And when clients see that, you know, they see a good team, they bring them back. Terrific. Brian, uh, I assume it's kind of the same, but uh, do you have a, a per different perspective on that? No, I, I think he kind of hit it. It's it's really what, like you said, it's trust. You know, I have, I have several clients that I've had for over 20 years and, you know, I think what, what makes them keep coming back is they know they can call me and I'm, I'm the type of personality that I, you know, I answer my phone pretty much any time or I'll check email anytime. It's not like at five o'clock, I turn it off. I right. try. But, of course. Uh, and and they know they they can hand me something and they're going to get it back and it's going to be right and it's going to be what they want and and they know that I'm always looking out you know for them and the project and um so it's it's just that trust you know that you build up over time and 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 I think that comes with experience is they don't have to do a lot of hand holding they don't have to do a lot of explaining a lot of whatever they can just say here's this project clean it up mix it make it sound really good and send it back and it's not a lot of back and forth you know um so. I, I love that transition where they have to be sitting next to you for a while and then all of a sudden they just go oh you you can handle this i don't need to be here right and yep. then you, you go yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah yep exactly and, right. and there's yeah there's nothing wrong with the client uh, being there but uh, it's that great transition with, um uh, go ahead I'm jumping over with brian's uh thoughts on trust that goes uh, in location sound as well. A producer, our director, they're going to lean on you to make sure the sound is good. So if you know you're shooting outside and a plane goes over, or you know, uh, you know, cars or sirens, they're going to want to know that and and trust that you you'll raise your hand and say, "Hey, maybe we should do another take." And uh, you know, I'm sure post audio appreciates appreciates that as well oh that that is to me that's kind of like the ultimate do unto others type of thing where you just don't want them to be pulling their hair out it's just like it's bad form <laughs> to have that the audio come over and have people going oh god no here we yeah. go especially on um, a ceo or you know absolutely. somebody you're not yeah. another chance with um, we do have uh, some questions coming in from uh, the audience. I have something from uh, 
young woman, Sarah Bellamy, and we're looking uh, for her question. She says, since networking is a big part of film with all the COVID regulations and online classes, how would you say students can start networking? This is great. How could students can start networking and getting to know prof professors well this fall? Terrific question. Go ahead, uh, go ahead, Sean. Uh, yeah, um, I don't know. You can get a hold of me because I need to do some networking uh, now with COVID. All the all the work went away. Um, but there's a lot of uh, groups on Facebook and uh, other areas, um, LinkedIn and you know, those types of websites. Uh, those are great for networking. Um, kind of flip through and you know, see what you can do there, drop a quick message, say hi, and, uh, you know, things start to roll. As far as uh, online classes, uh, yeah, I uh, don't really have any real thoughts about that one. But networking, just anything you can do to, uh, you know, meet somebody new or have a friend, introduce a friend, and, you know, kind of snowballs from there. Brian, your, your, your perspective on this? That's that's a, it's a tough one, and I think we're all we're all sort of trying to figure figure that out um, as far as the networking goes. Um, it, you know, I, I I would tell people if for anyone who's who's going to want to get back when things get back to work, and and Chicago is getting ready to to sort of start probably here in a month. You know, with some of the the, the studios and the production stuff. Um, I, I would definitely recommend to everybody to read up on. COVID and the the procedures and things that are in place. Um, understand how a film set's going to work. There's a lot of great uh, documents out there. Um, SAG and all of the, the unions kind of came together and did a document. It's about 35 pages long. Um, that and, and make sure you just understand that because I think I think people who um, are going to hire be hiring and and they want to know that people understand it and they're going to be flexible and going to be because those sets are going to look very very different um and and sean can speak to that too um in, in terms of in studio um you know i've had to do we've had to do a lot of stuff here differently um we just simply can't operate the way we were before um you know we have to clean rooms all the time and and um, make sure it's just it's it's clean and sterile and all of that stuff. So when people do come in, um, and then just is, is in terms of the, that's kind of off off topic a little bit, but um, I just think that I think people when they start hiring are going to be looking for people who are going to be flexible, who are going to understand those kinds of policies and things like that. So that's um, a really good point. Really good point. And then, you know, networking. My, I, you know, I have two son, one son in college, and he's been doing a lot of online stuff, and he he just talks to his professors as much as he can through Zoom classes and things like that. And I think, unfortunately, that's what's available to them in terms of you know connecting with with professors and and stuff like that. Um, the networking stuff. It, it, Chicago usually has a lot of networking things going on, and a lot of those have at least the in person ones have stopped. Um, there's actually a cool one this week. There's a, a thing called the Midwest uh, Film Festival, and they actually are they hired out. Usually, it's at a theater here in town. What they did is they actually hired a a drive-in for a night, um, and so they're going to do a bunch of short film um, stuff, playback and stuff, you know, in a, at a drive-in. I thought that was kind of a really cool and sort of creative way of, you know, getting people out to see films, but they can stay in the, you know stay in their cars and and uh you know kind of stay stay socially distanced and stuff like that so you know at least here i think there's some creative things that are going on in terms of networking um you just gotta like like sean said just keep your eye on facebook and join some of those groups um and really just you know look out for any opportunity that you can find as as we sort of all work through this this sort of unique time you know i again from a from a teacher perspective, a professor's perspective, um, for me, uh, while I was teaching, getting an email from a student with a, an intelligent question or, or someone just, you know, just in, inquiring about the classwork in general, that always just made me feel great. D professors are not celebrities. They're, and I'm sure you all know this, um, they 
I, the best of them love to get that feedback. And a simple email, as low tech as it seems right now, is, is huge. If they know you, uh, as the semester comes to a close, um, they're going to remember you. And that, that translates into all sorts of goodwill and um, clearly, practically speaking, a much better, uh, a much good, better grade. Yay. Okay, um, Brian. We, we've this is an audiovisual medium, and yet we haven't, except for our faces, we haven't had uh, much visual. Um, our um, producer has set up uh, a trailer that you showed us uh, a short time ago, and um, uh, Randy, if you're uh, in a position to do it, if if you wouldn't mind just uh, throwing that up there and showing some of the things that you do visually and audio wise in your business, Brian, can can we do that? Yeah. Oop, there it is. This is what I brought you here to see. Yikes. <laughs> all, all I can see is a ton of work. I mean, despite the aesthetics of it and, and how nice it is, uh, can you can you tell us just a little bit about um, the the arc of that in terms of the audio and what what we were seeing? Certainly. Um, so so a lot of the work I do uh, for Bungie is is uh, cinematic or cutscene work. Um, as a third party vendor, it's it's hard to to plug into those video game companies um, when you're not uh, you know sort of. On, on in their building with their team and everything else. So cinematics and cutscenes are one of those things that you know they can kind of hand off to us, um, and we can, can, can. I'm sorry. Can you explain cutscene? So basically, when you you know when you're playing a game, you know you're playing along, and then you finish a level, and you go to a a, a short video of something that advances the story. Basically, okay. um, they can be thirty seconds long. They can be five minutes long. They can be you know they they can be all over the place in terms of length. Um, and they basically just something that brings you from this particular level to the next level and sort of advance that story. And they just play play as a, as a video. Um, so for that particular one, that, that this was more of a trailer for, for this upcoming um, release. Um, so basically what we do with these, so everything you heard, you know, we're kind of doing. The music, uh, they have composers um, 
that that do all the music uh, in this particular instance, and then they give us that music um, to work against, um, as well as the voices they record. They have a lot of voices kind of all, all over the place, so they record those in, in studios kind of around the world. Um, but all the sound design is stuff that we that we did. We so we had to do all the footsteps, you know, the special effects, um, the ships, um, any kind of weapons. Uh, body movement, you know, he's, he's, he's all very, a lot of these characters got armor on, they've got capes, um, a lot of different kinds of stuff. So we're doing, we're doing Foley work um, uh, as well. Um, what tends to happen a little bit is, is so a lot of those, those some of those assets are, are in game. So some of those ships, you know, might be in game. So they're, they'll have built a sound for that. Um, some of the weapons will have an in-game asset. Um, so they'll give us those assets and we'll use those and then we just kind of build around them to complete the landscape. Um, for uh, about a, about a, two years ago, we uh, we were doing a lot of these these cinematics and a lot of them we noticed that we're having were like ice and snow and that kind of thing. So we um, we actually did like a, about two days, we went and, went and bought about 150 pounds of ice in various forms and we brought it into the studio and we crushed it up and we just we just made a whole library of different kinds of footsteps and and uh, you know stabbing and all different kinds of things and we just kept it as a as a library and, and when this one came around we were like oh we get to go back into that library a little bit and use some of those, those oh footsteps. isn't that great when you yeah. when you've when you've done a little extra work before that oh my gosh we can apply this now that's, yeah that's yeah. terrific so so yeah <clears throat> so then we just we just took all those elements and and you know, bring, bring them all together to get a, you know, get a really good mix going. And then, uh, and then, and this is where the trust thing comes in. You know, I, I send it off to them. They don't, they don't typically give me a lot of direction. You know, they just hand them off to me and say, make them cool. So it's kind of fun when, when that's your direction. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that's basically the, the, the path for those. The flow. Um, this is, this is to both of you. Uh, Michelle uh, writes us, um, in an industry inundated with new must-have technology, how do you tell young people how to balance the gear or the equipment versus the knowledge of how to use it? Uh, let's, yeah, let's start, sorry. Let's start with Sean. Um, as far as the knowledge of how to use it, uh, most of the time you just kind of, flounder through if you know the basics about you know a camera or an audio deck and you know um, you know how to interface the two or you know basic uh, meter reading um, then you can kind of fumble through any piece of gear most piece of gears that are thrown at you and uh, because they they do come uh, so fast and frequently um, usually you work with the other people on the set to you know work with them to uh, teach them you know camera tricks in the menus or you know they can help you out with dealing with things like where do you find the time code on the camera you know where am i plugging that into yeah, yeah. so um see yeah. so much of that is you're right it's kind of on the fly um and it, oh man, I'll tell you, just from my own experience, it sure doesn't hurt to be in touch with industry publications and stuff like that. I'm, I'm, I find myself a little guilty uh, of kind of not doing that as much as I should. And again, that's almost, it's almost like a networking thing where you want to, you need to know what's, what's current. And the, a lot of the best way to find it is even the manufacturers themselves have stuff because they they're all in commerce, right? And they want to they want to sell stuff. So, yeah. well, and uh, you know, since uh, the lockdown, some of the companies uh, one I'm specifically thinking about is uh, Sennheiser. You know, they're doing um, demos with their uh, microphones and that. Some of the wireless uh, companies, you know, they'll do webcasts uh, very similar to this, you know, work, walk through their gear and oh, of course, yeah. back to uh, Facebook and that there's plenty of uh, groups on there with uh, people from around the world uh, with experiences that you may jump in, 
be jumping into, or you may have had and, you know, kind of see how they dealt with it or ask a question about how you should deal with something. Um, yeah. Really quickly, if I just a really quick story about, about this exact thing. Um, I, I was, I've been on, I was on pro tools for over 20 years. And then when I came to noise floor, um, I, they, they actually don't use pro tools here. They use a program called Nuendo and it was, you know, at, at 45 years old, it was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to learn a new, a whole new way to work or, and you know, it was, it was pretty nerve wracking when, when, at the time. And then what I quickly realized is once I figured out where the buttons were and what the, you know, where they, what they called things and how they routed things and all of that, it, it, it's just another tool. And, and so, you know, it, it really, I would, I always tell students and things like that, focus on, on the craft, focus on what you're doing. All of these programs are going to do virtually the same thing. You just got to figure out where it is. So if you're jumping from logic to Nuendo to Pro Tools to uh, Reaper or whatever, it, it's all in there. You just got to figure out where it is. And, and so definitely focus on the art, focus on the craft. How are you going to use that particular hammer and what it can do? You know. Yeah, they're only tools. Exactly. And I, I really like that, focusing on the craft. I think, and I... I just, you know, a plug for people I love, um, the film and video uh, program at Grand Valley, to me, puts that emphasis exactly where it's where it belongs. Gear is always in the service of the story. And I think that's, exactly I think right. that's something that's consciously taught. Uh, we have some more questions uh, looking for Alex. Hey, Alex, I know you. Um, Let's take a look at his question, if you guys can see it. What's the future of audio, in your uh, opinion? Video games, film, TV, radio? Uh, Boy, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a hard one to, to, to know. Um, I, I, can, I, I can tell you one thing. Video games isn't going anywhere. Video games is huge. Um, it, it, you know, it's a, it's a huge industry. Um, and, and, you know, games are being made every single day. Um, Film, I think, is 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 always going to be around. It's changing, and and certainly the the distribution is is changing. Um, there's a there's a ton more places for films to get played than than when I started in the business. Um, you know, you got Netflix, and you got tons of online distribution methods. Um, so I think it's really just understanding standards and understanding where things are going to get played more than ever. Um, Radio, I, I don't, I don't know. I, 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 I it, it's hard to say what's going to happen there. Um, one area that I'm actually very in, intrigued in right now is uh, the area of sort of scripted podcasts. Um, uh, it's kind of a throwback to you know the radio dramas of the you know 30s, 40s, 50s. You know, it's, it's kind of circling back here a little bit. Um, and, and you know, there's a lot of scripted podcasts kind of stuff happening, which I think is kind of cool because it's it's strictly audio, which is great. Um, no, no pesky picture to get in the way. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm kidding, of course. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm kind of really intrigued by those um, and where those kind of go. Great. Um, the, we have a question from Suzanne. Uh, there we go. Uh, great question as well. What's the best way for graduates to work, to get to work in sound? What experience slash knowledge should they have? Sean, what do you think? <laughs> um, one of the best ways is, uh, you know, stick with uh, the students, you know, the people you graduated with. Um, I graduated in 95 and I still uh, work with a lot of people uh, from school days. Um, if you're going to do audio, you know, jumping in and kind of fitting in in on the team. You know, um, everybody wants to be a producer, director, camera guy. Those are the the glamour jobs. But um, you know, if you you bring something to the table that nobody else has, um, with even a basic knowledge of audio and sound, um, you know, you just start. It's all about on the job training, really. So you can get the basics at school, but, you know, get out, see if you can find a mentor, um, somebody you can job shadow on a job or two. And yeah, 
You know, what I thought was really nice about what you said, oh, there you are now. Um, what you said was you're doing light, light and grip stuff on the set and you see that there's all, there's this need for audio. It To me, it's like when you're on the set and you see something that needs doing, if you do it, people recognize that. And a lot of that is having that kind of sense of looking over the set and seeing what needs doing. And your point about the need for audio is uh, backed up by what I get at the studio all the time, is that we get films to do post-production sound on, and the, the producer or director comes in always with kind of the excuse of, yeah, well, one of the reasons we're bringing it to you is because the sound is a little iffy. And I'm just going, oh, no, save me. <laughs> uh, but um, what that says is there's, there are, um, there's, there's room out there for good sound people. There's a need. And all, all that is is just being observant. You know, if you get the chance to be on a set, observe and learn. You know, Brian, do you have anything on that as well? Yeah, I, I think it's 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 a lot of what he said. Um, I think you guys you just gotta, you know, video game audio is is a wide open field. I, I think there's there's a ton of game companies that pop up and they're looking for good sound people, um, always. Um, at least in here in Chicago, production audio is a is a very it's a good field for for people that you know we have a lot of you know there's several network shows going on so they they kind of soak up a lot of people so there's always opportunities to be on commercials and and those kinds of things so it's a pretty pretty wide open as well um in post a little trickier uh, you know there's not a, not a ton of places like like ours um but that but there's a ton of ton of content being created there's more content being created than ever before and 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 like sean said just stay in contact with, with people you went to school with or or whatever because the, you know what they're going to make content and so I, I always as much as you can try not to get if you want to do sound do sound don't don't get distracted by obviously we all got to work and we got to eat and pay rent and all of that kind of stuff but just keep working you know and and eventually talent and creativity and all of that will 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 float to the top and people will recognize it and will you know You'll you'll get you'll start to get work, um, so you just got to you know persevere and and um, you know just keep keep doing it. So, yep. Um, I was thinking, um, kind of. I guess we might say as a as a wrap up, maybe some final thoughts. Um, many years ago, it was I'm sure in the '90s when uh, we had a segment at River City um, with my Audio Three students. Uh, about the industry, one of our alumna, uh, alumnuses, alumni, uh, Joe Warner, I believe his name was, came and talked to uh, the students. And he, he was in Hollywood for quite some time and did a lot of work. And at the end of, the, um, at the end of his talk, I asked, you know, give me a one sentence um, impression of what it what it takes to be uh, successful in the business and it was kind of jaw-dropping in a way but it was very joe warner and he said i'll tell you what the two words are be nice and i thought that's that's hell of an idea um he said you're always going to find experts in in the field and in their particular uh, job on the set. Um, but if you come and but if you're not nice, you can be great. But people just don't want to work with you. Now I I don't want that to to steer you to any one particular thing. But um, if you were to give uh, Brian a kind of a one sentence. Um, or a few word summary about what it takes to be successful in the business. What that, what might that be to you? Um, well, it's hard to top be nice, but um, <laughs> I, I would say, I, I, you know, patience is always a big thing for me. 
you know, uh, and that, and that goes along with being nice, but just being patient, you know, um, you know, every client is different. Every, every need is different. Um, and then to go along with that is, is creativity. You know, we're here to tell stories. We're here to, you know, and, and make things, you know, sound as good as we can. But along with that creativity is, is where the patience comes in because a lot of times, you know, and, and you guys, I'm sure know this, you want to do something one way and, you know, you have really cool or grand ideas and then the client's like, no, 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 we don't want to do any of that. We want it to be simpler. So you got to be patient when you think it wants to be one way and they want it another way. It's like, well, okay, you're the client. So, so you just got to be patient and, and, and hopefully you can work in some of your ideas and your creativity, uh, you know, and, and, and at least in my experience, a lot of my clients will be like, oh, I hadn't really thought of it. That's a really cool idea, you know. And, and so just just staying patient and being creative, you know, because everything the story is story is everything, in, you know, and, and everything we do is, you know, is in, is in service to that. And Sean, um, I'm going to go with pay attention uh, when when you're out on a set, uh, you have to have your eyes open all, all the time. Um, so you know what the producer and director want, and DP, and kind of the general uh, story that you're trying to convey. Um, you know, you can learn a lot uh, from that. Just kind of stand back and and pay attention. Right on. I, you know, I, my feelings about that fall right along uh, you guys' lines. But I, um, my. Uh, mantra is um, the the client is it. That's it. End of story. Your your ability to if whatever happens, it's got to start with them. It has to come from them. Now you can steer it once once you know what the what their real desire is, um, but it's it's their thing. And I don't know how many times I've just taken a deep breath and said, director so-and-so, you're the last word. Um, I like my idea. I'm saying this, of course, in my brain, uh, but but you're it. And I think if you keep in mind who, you know, the, the story comes first, of course, but in pra but practical matter, uh, it's, um, it's the client. And uh, they're the ones that uh, butter your bread, so to speak. Um, you know what? I, I think that um, uh, we're we're nearing our end time here uh, briefly, and I I do I want to say how grateful uh, we all are that you guys uh, had a chance to do this, and we're we're willing to to do it. We're grateful that you took up the invitation. Um, I should mention our next show is August twentieth at um, at twelve noon, and uh, the. Wonderful subject. Uh, the subject is uh, moving to LA, and uh, what a great what a great subject that's going to be. Um, not sure of our guests yet, but uh, you will know. And uh, so I say thank you so much, both of you, for uh, taking your time to do this. And uh, we hope you hope to see you on the set somewhere uh, in the future. Thank you, All and right. thanks for everybody to. Um, for watching and listening to Alumni Live. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, guys. Thanks,